Our first lesson this morning comes from Psalm 139, verses 1 through 18, found on pages 577 to 578 in the Old Testament of your Pew Bibles. If you would like to read along, hear now God's word for you and for me this day. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down. You are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O oh Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in shale, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will cover me and night wraps itself around me, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me, when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O oh God. How vast is the sum of them. I try to count them. They are more than the sand. I come to the end. I am still with you. Amen.
Amen. Thank you, Kate. I'm actually going to circle back in just a few minutes to 1 Samuel 7, so I invite you now to join me as we pray for God's illumination together. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer, our savior and our friend. Amen. I confess that sometimes at church, we pull out Psalm 139's most lyrical verses. We use them a little out of context for their comfort and for their beauty. Like I'm sure you have heard before this morning, it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made beautiful. And maybe you have heard, how weighty are your thoughts, O God, poignant. These verses sound like someone who's waxing poetic about the vastness of God and the comfort it is to be made and known by such a vast God. And that is true. But when we hear those beautiful lines in the context of their own psalm, they make the reflections even more poignant because the psalmist is actually wrestling with God here. He knows that he's fully seen and known, but he also knows that his heart wanders. He tests the limits of God's presence. He even tries to get away. Sometimes the knowledge of an ever-present God is too intense. It's more daunting than delightful, more convicting than comforting to always be in the presence of God. Have you ever looked someone in the eye? I mean, had real eye contact, and you thought, how engaging that is, how respectful. But then it went on too long, <laughs> and you got uncomfortable, and you had to look away. Imagine that experience as an encounter with God. It is so lovely to think of God seeing us, really seeing us, knowing that we were in God's eye even when we were in our mother's wombs. We are part of a beautiful, fearful creation. But then we do and see and say things we'd rather God not see so clearly. It would feel better if God would just look away a minute. The psalmist is somewhere in that experience of a persistent, intense gaze, but the gaze is God's. He's testing out the idea that he might try to get away from God, wondering whether God's love withstands scrutiny. When our kids were small, one of our go-to bed bedtime stories was Margaret Wise Brown's book from 1942, The Runaway Bunny. Do you all remember The Runaway Bunny? Everyone gets a copy. Just kidding. Now, I have no reason to think that Margaret Wise Brown was reinterpreting Psalm 139, but this psalm comes to mind every time I read that sweet book. The book is a dialogue between a baby bunny and a mama bunny. And the baby bunny knows he is loved. That never seems to be in doubt in the story. But the baby bunny is trying out the limits of love. He's a curious and adventuresome young fellow, so he tells his mother that he has decided to run away. His mother says, if you run away, I will run after you, for you are my little bunny. Undeterred, the young bunny looks for loopholes in his mother's determined presence. He says, if you run after me, I'll become a fish in a trout stream and I'll swim away from you. If you become a fish, she says, I will become a fisherman and I will fish for you. They go on with this pattern in the sweet way kids envision that they can become anything and also in the insightful way kids test the limits of love. The bunny says that he will become a rock on a high mountain, then a crocus in a hidden garden, 
then a bird that flies away, then a sailboat that sails away, and then a trapeze artist, to which his mother calmly replies that she will become a rock climber on the high mountain to get to him, or a gardener tending a crocus, or a tree in which a flying bird can land, or the wind that guides a sailboat, or a tightrope walker that meets a trapeze artist in the air. The baby bunny tries one last idea. He says, well, I will become a little boy and run into a house. To which his mother replies, then I will become your mother and catch you in my arms. Well, shucks, says the bunny. I might just as well stay where I am and be your little bunny. And so he does. Have a carrot says his mother. The psalmist wonders whether God's love will hold fast, even if he is fully known and seen. He wonders whether he can ever get away from God's intense gaze, and he asks, where can I go to flee from you? If I go to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in shale, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning, like a bird, or settle at the farthest limits of the sea, like a sailboat, even there, your hand will lead me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say the darkness will cover you, that's nothing, the darkness is as bright as day for you. The psalmist doesn't say, well, shucks, at the end, but he does say, I come to the end, and I am still with you. Like Psalm 139, our hymn for this morning is the song of a person who's wrestling with a persistent, loving God. He knows he has wandered. He's even gotten himself into some trouble and needs rescuing. He knows that even while he praises God for God's mercy, he is also prone to leave the very God he loves. Come, thou fount of every blessing is a lot like Psalm 139. So beautiful to sing, so lyrical in rhythm and comforting with its pentatonic tones that we might sing right over the gut punch of its words. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Just after singing thanks, for the grace that saves and the goodness that persists, we confess that our hearts still wander, that we put the enduring love of God to the test until we need to be pursued, followed, and held again. This great hymn of our faith was written by a man named Robert Robinson around 1758. Robinson was born in England in 1735, and his father died when he was a kid. His mother didn't have money for him to pursue education. So when he was 14, Robert became a barber's apprentice, and that seemed like a great trajectory. He had a clear vocation ahead of him. He was not a person of faith, maybe even a skeptic. But when he was 17, Robert went to hear a traveling evangelist named George Whitfield, who was coming through London to preach as part of what we know as the Great Awakening. That day, in 1752, Whitfield preached about repentance, and the 17-year-old barber's apprentice felt convicted. For two years after that day, he wrestled with faith. He wrestled with a sense of call trying to get away from the God who was persistently following him. He went on to find and hear other prominent preachers, including John Wesley, and he ultimately decided to become a pastor. He served a Calvinistic Methodist chapel. You don't find those much anymore. He served independent and Baptist congregations. And when he was still young in life and in ministry, he wrote this hymn. It's both the confession of a wanderer and the gratitude of one who has been found. 
Even as he knows he's a debtor to God's grace, he also knows he is prone to leave his God. It's a song of faith in progress, ever testing the unlimited nature of God's love. Robinson doesn't quote scripture in the hymn exactly, but there is one line that alludes to our second lesson for the day, 1 Samuel chapter 7. It happens in the section of verses 3 to 12. This is a pretty deep cut in the story of Samuel and the Israelites, whose hearts were prone to wander for centuries. The reference comes at the beginning of verse 2 of the hymn, and I hope after today we'll never sing it the same way again. Robinson wrote, Here I raise my Ebenezer. Sing it. Hither by thy help I'm come. No. Hither by thy help I'm come. These folks knew it. Here I raise my Ebenezer. Hither by thy help I'm come. What on earth? In the story Robinson draws from, Samuel has grown up to become a priest and a prophet to the Israelites. In 1 Samuel 7, he is chastising them because they've gotten involved with foreign gods. They've been fickle in their trust for their God. Samuel tells them they need to put those other gods aside. And he promises that if they will repent, they, if they will, in Samuel's words, direct their hearts to the Lord, the Lord will deliver them from their enemies, the Philistines. Well, the Israelites finally, after much chastising from Samuel, decide to listen, and they reopen their hearts to the Lord. So Samuel gathers them at a high place up on a hill called Mizpah, and he leads them through a ritual of confession and repentance. But while they're gathered up on this hill, the Philistines, their enemies, see a chance to attack thinking the Israelites are sitting ducks up there. They're focused on God, not this battle. It's quite the dramatic scene. As the Philistines gather themselves for the ambush, the voice of God thunders and confuses them, and Israel defeats the Philistines. After the battle, Samuel takes a stone, and he puts it up as a sort of marker, as a memorial, he names it Ebenezer. He says to the Israelites, Thus far the Lord has helped us. Ebenezer was a place where the Israelites had been, and it's a word that means stone of help. That stone is a reminder that in spite of their wandering, in spite of the fact that Israel let other gods into their hearts, in spite of their faith and progress, the Lord is their rock. The Lord has never abandoned them and has always been their help. When he wrote, Come Thou Fount, the young minister, Robert Robinson, acknowledged that his faith was a work in progress, that he would test the limits of God's love. But he looks back and he sees that God has been faithfully present with him all along. So he sets his Ebenezer, a reminder that the Lord has helped thus far, and the Lord will help forever. Where can I go to flee from you? If I go to heaven, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning, if I become a bird, you're there. If I try to sail away, even there, your hand will hold me. Young Robinson, the prophet Samuel, whoever first prayed Psalm 139, even the runaway bunny know what we feel too. Sometimes we wander. Sometimes we test even the greatest loves we know. Sometimes we're grateful for grace and fickle in heart at the very same moment. But the Lord has helped us, and the Lord will never, ever leave us alone. The most remarkable moment in each of these stories is maybe the one when, in spite of their wandering, 
someone offers God their heart. The Israelites trusted that they were forgiven and directed their hearts back to God. Our bunny friend, finished with imagining, rests in the embrace of his mother. Robert Robinson, knowing that he would continue to fall short, writes anyway, here's my heart, Lord, as if to say, you know what it is, incomplete, flawed, wandering, fickle, but take it anyway. I'm going to keep messing this up. I'm going to keep putting you to the test, even when I know you are the grace I need. But what I have to give is my heart. So take it. In fact, seal it so nothing else can get in. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. We are prone to wander too. May we remember that God continues to find and hold us. So let us offer again what we have. Here are our hearts, Lord. Take and seal them. Seal them for your courts above. Amen.